And welcome back to Catfish on Ice. This is episode 142. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. As we roll along through this offseason, we've got about, what, a little over a month left until the regular season starts, so we can't wait for that. We've got ourselves a really outstanding guest joining us today. That is Joe of Tendy Talk Podcast, otherwise known as Washed Up Goalie. Need to go follow Joe's podcast, uh, Washed Up Goalie, at Washed Up Goalie on Twitter. Joe, how are you doing? Thanks so much for joining us. Doing good. You know, it's, it's not a Monday, so uh, that makes life better. For sure. <laughs> yep. Yeah. What is it? It's Tuesday's a little bit better, and then we just keep going on after that. All yeah, right. exactly. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, let's get this rolling here because we have a lot of listeners of Catfish on Ice and Predators fans. As you know, National Predators fans, we love our goalies down here. We had yes. Pecorine. We had Pecorine for all those years. Now we have our uh, we have Juice UC Saros. We've got um, Iroslava Skarov, arguably the best goaltending prospect in the world now. So we just love ourselves some goaltenders. But first off, hey, how about let, you tell let's, everybody. Let's not forget the e bugs. You know, let's give Bones and Goose some love too. There you go. Yeah, we can't <laughs> forget about those as well. Which I think you had a really awesome guest on your show recently on the Tendy Talk podcast. You can tell us about that as well. But. Um, yeah, tell us uh, about your podcast, the content you do, how you got into it. Just we we want to learn all that. Yeah, so Tendy Talk, it's uh, is the name would would tell you. It's just a couple goalies sitting there talking hockey, and uh, I, I've had phantom goalies on all the way up through Hall of Fame, Stanley Cup winning uh, goalies, gold medal winning goalies, uh, and it's just talking about how we got started in the game, why why we chose to uh, stand in front of the puck instead of shoot it. Um, but also what, what we do outside of the game too, you know, what excites us, you know, I, I had Eddie Belfour and his son Dane on, and they were talking about their whiskey they've got going on. I, I had Don Strauss, the, uh, uh, mask painter and creator of the armadillo mask made famous by John Van Beesbrook. You know, his background is really in auto racing and he just kind of fell into, uh, he, he actually never played goalie, but he, he's so, so entrenched in the goalie community. I had to have him on, but, uh, then a guy like Mike McKenna, journeyman auto racing is kind of it auto racing and cooking are his thing away from hockey so it's kind of fun to find you know what that uh, other side of the goalie is when when we take that mask off and you know and then i mentioned taking the mask off i've had uh justin goldman from uh the goalie guild he was also the colorado e-bug for a while uh and and he's very much into the mental health side of things and started the lift the mask project where you know goalies talking to other goalies and just uh not being silent and suffering with our own, our own minds by ourselves, you know, yeah. seeking help when we need it. In fact, uh, mm -hmm. Justin was one of two repeat guests I've had. The first repeat guest I had was actually Bones. He was my first guest. So when I, I hit one year, I had to have him back on. But uh, Justin, with his background, um, I, I lost my mom on Mother's Day and he had lost his mom about a year earlier. And uh it, it was a little tough. So I, I had him back on just mm -hmm. to talk about loss and, you know, how hockey helps yeah. and all that. And it, it was a fantastic episode, very therapeutic by, by far. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's the kind of stuff that, that listeners really love. And that's why your, your podcast is doing so awesome. I've, I li I've listened to it many times. It's just really great stuff. And, you know, when it comes to goalies, I mean, we all just really love our goalies. You know, if you're a <laughs> hockey fan, that's just the, because like you said, I mean, you're wearing that mask. You're kind of out there on an island. Yes, you have your teammates out there protecting you. But, like, for instance, anytime a goalie gets, like, rushed by the opponent, you know, you, his teammates are going to run in there. And, like, just the camaraderie and the protection of the goaltender is something that I love personally as a hockey fan. So, uh, yeah, go check out the Tendy Talk podcast if you haven't already. All right, so we're being joined by Joe, otherwise known as Washed Up Goalie. All right, I love that name, by the way. That's so awesome. That's so <laughs> hilarious. All right, so let's let's talk about the current uh, makeup of goaltenders right now in the NHL, and I want to get your opinion on who is the best right now, or is it impossible to answer that? Let's let's uh, fit in UC Soros into that equation and see kind of where you think he fits, because I think most people agree that Soros is right there on that elite tier but maybe he's mm -hmm. still kind of young and he's still got a little bit ways to go. So I want to really get your thoughts on all that. Yeah. You know, that, that's kind of a loaded question. I, I, I've been a fan of this game for a long time. Uh, you know, several, uh, uh, I don't want to call them generations, but kind of evolutions of the position. You know, mm -hmm. when I first started watching the game, you know, 
well, when I was born, you still had goalies wearing the fiberglass mask and brown uh, leg pads. In fact, my first pair of association pads were brown 70s era pads. So that the positions mm-hmm. change. And I think we're in one of those evolutions where you've got kind of the old guard, the new guard. Um, so it's, it's kind of fun because we're seeing some of those older guys retire and the newer guys like uh, Saros come up. But if we're talking the top two in the league, and I say top two because it's so close, mm-hmm. it's got to be Igor out there in New York and uh, Vasilevsky in Tampa yeah. Bay. They, they've proven mm-hmm. that they're they're one and two right now. Uh, Saros, I think he he can be in that conversation, but it he's got a few years to get under his belt. Um, mm-hmm. You know, he, even Vasilevsky, if you look at him when he came on the scene, yeah, he was good but he wasn't uh, as dominant as he, as he is now. It's, it's like a, a quarterback in football. Very rarely does one hop in in the first year or two and dominate. They, they need that uh, growing pains. And even when a guy like Mahomes jumps in, he, yeah. he has that sophomore slump. And um, I don't think Saros is going to, you know, regress by any means. It's just more, more teams are going to build a book on him and, yeah, find his weaknesses and he's going to work hard and he's going to tighten up those weaknesses and just get better. It's uh, Having grown up in Chicago and being a Blackhawks fan, I'm not too excited that the Predators were able to replace, you know, one Hall of Fame caliber goalie with uh, what could be another one. Um, mm. <laughs> but hey, it, it is what it is. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, you know, so the thing about Soros for a lot of us is we know he's we're lucky to have him and that mm-hmm. uh, on many nights he is going to steal a lot of points for us when we have no business getting those points. He was a workhorse last year, probably played too many games in my opinion, uh, led the league in starts among goaltenders. And so we're hoping that uh, some of that pressure can be taken off of him with a f- former Blackhawks goalie, uh, Kevin Lankin in is who we picked up in the off season, which yep. kind of surprised all of us. So we didn't really see that coming because of Connor Ingram, um, another goaltender that played really well in the playoffs against the Avalanche. He had a game where he was pretty much shutting out the Avs in game two, and we all thought, okay, this is kind of the uh, rehearsal for him to be the full-time backup of Soros, but they took Lincoln. And what do you think about – since you are a Blackhawks fan, tell some Predators fans here who might not know a lot about Lincoln and, and what what's his pros and cons, and especially being a backup goaltender. What do you think he could do? Yeah, you know, so Lincoln kind of came on – the scene, and he, he came on with a fury, had a great start. Um, and that, that was kind of when the Hawks unexpectedly traded Crawford because I, I think they knew he was going to retire and they mm-hmm. said, let's get something for him. Uh, so they, they, they just needed to plug some gaps. They, they threw him in there and he played really well, but I, I think they threw him in too soon in his development. And uh Goalies, in my opinion, they need a couple of years at the AHL to really develop their game because mm-hmm. they need to play. The thing is, if, if a goalie is sitting on the bench not playing, they're not developing. So mm-hmm. that's why I think the Lincoln in acquisition is really nice for the Preds because now he can play that backup role. You know, in the follow you were mentioning earlier, he can go to the AHL and he can play every night and Milwaukee and, and get those reps in that he needs. I, I really think that's where the thinking was with Nashville is um, it wasn't that they thought Lincoln in was a better goalie. He's just got more time in the NHL and they know he can be a serviceable backup. Hmm. Um, the more I watched him in Chicago, I liked him. I think he has potential. Um, and kind of like when they let Colin Delia go too, another good young goaltender that got thrown into it earlier. I think the Hawks realized that both of those guys needed a change of scenery. They, they needed a different um, a vo- voice talking to them because they were thrown in and I think they got a little jaded. Um, so it, it was a good move for both of those guys. Lankin in, he said, I like him, but I, I think he, his footwork, he does a little too much at times. He, he overshoots his targets a little bit because he's he's so smooth and technical that uh, it almost hinders him. <laughs> mm. He pushes a little too, too hard. He, he's he's too efficient in his movements that he yeah. he goes a little further and it, it's it's not obvious to the casual fan 
Um, you know, I, I like talking about my dad. He's followed, you know, me through goalie clinics and everything else. He's got an idea of the game. But when him and I are watching goalies, we're watching two different things. And there will be times where when we're watching a game, he's going, what are you seeing? And I'll explain it to him. He's like, I, I, I wouldn't have picked up on that. But now that you mention it, I see it. And if, if you watch Lincoln and uh, I, I like watching him in warmups and he's doing all of his crease movements and box control is a big thing in, in goaltending where if you put strings on the corners of each post and take it down to the puck, it's where you are in that box. Lincoln and kind of goes over that box as he's moving side to side. Um, not a bad thing at times, but I think he does it too much. Interesting. And that's a really cool perspective coming from a goaltender as well. I love getting the actual goaltender's <laughs> perspective who's played the position because it is way different than what you're seeing it as, as a fan. Um, and then, yeah, so when it comes to Lincoln and for me, I'm hoping he get around 20, 20 starts um, and take some of that load off of Sorrow so that hopefully – when and if the Predators are back in that playoff picture again, a fresh UC Soros can go in ready to, um, you know, really put this team on his back in the playoffs and, and take him further than maybe anyone would expect, kind of like in 2017. But let's go ahead and segue to that. So we've got a we've got Joe of the Tendy Talk podcast. He just mentioned that he is a Chicago Blackhawks fan. Everyone be nice to him. Just because he's a Blackhawks <laughs> fan doesn't make him a bad person. Uh, we got to watch out with these Preds fans. They get really, really defensive when it's uh, anything Blackhawks associated. But um, so I, you retweeted our most hated teams 2022 summer of 2022 bracket for Preds fans. Um, and we're doing this bracket. We did the whole first round. We made the Blackhawks our number one overall seed. If you're thinking March Madness NCAA tournament, the Blackhawks are like the top seed that everyone expects to win. <laughs> but um, it's been a lot of fun. Of course, I can't even remember who I put the Blackhawks up against in the first round. But it was a, it was like a it was a landslide. But um, you, you could have put them against the uh, eighty Russian Olympic hockey team, and I think <laughs> they still would have won. <laughs> You're probably right. But um, either way, I I wanted to see because this is I'm trying to be as scientific as possible here, and I guess what I'm thinking is. Has some of the dislike for the Blackhawks cooled off a little bit because the Blackhawks are rebuilding and, um, the, you know, it hasn't really – because I think the height of this rivalry for Preds, from a Preds fan perspective at least, it was when the Blackhawks were dominant. And, mm -hmm. you know, I remember that 2017 playoffs when we, uh, when we ended up drawing you all in the first round. I mean, we were – we pretty much took that as a loss right there. We were like, okay, we get to play the Blackhawks in the first round. It was fun while it lasted, but um, we're not going to get out of this first round. Didn't have a lot of confidence. And the next thing you know, we're, we're sweeping the Blackhawks. I, I, it, to this day, pre, most Preds fans are lying straight to your face if they saw the Preds winning that series, much less sweeping it. So it's a really fun rivalry, but it's cooled off a little bit recently. So I want to get your perspective as a Blackhawks fan. Obviously, the Blackhawks have a way more storied history than the Preds franchise. So, from a Blackhawks fan, what what does the Preds rivalry mean to you? Is it even a rivalry? Do you, like, what, what what do Blackhawks fans think of it? Well, when Blackhawks fans think of rivalries, first and foremost, it's Detroit. Detroit hmm. sucks. There, there's a great that it's still living on YouTube. A great old Hawks commercial back in the you know, sports channel days uh, when Hawks home games weren't on TV. Uh, Jeremy Piven is a Chicago native and Blackhawks fan. And they had him up in the 300 level. And he's talking about how he remembers his dad taking him to games and teaching him the two most important words in life. And it, it was, he just starts belting out Detroit sucks from the 300 level and the empty United center. And of course I, I went to a couple of Hawks Red Wings games at the United center. As soon as the puck dropped, you've got the Detroit sucks chance starting. And then the Red Wings fans are going, let's go Red Wings. Just back and forth all game. And remember it was right after the commercial dropped. It was a TV timeout and Scotty Bowman's the Red Wings coach at the time. And they play that commercial on the jumbotron and Bo I'm behind the Red Wings bench and you see Bowman look up and say, you know what, what is that? But with, with some more <laughs> color, colorful language and it, he kind of smirks. Uh, but, you know, that, that rivalry is more for the fans. Uh, it, mm -hmm. It's died a little bit since they put uh, the wings in the Eastern Conference. But 
both those fan bases understand the history. And so they're, they're going to hold yeah. on to that as much as for possible. Sure. For sure. After that comes the St. Louis blues. Um, mm. I, in, in the, this, the Chicago St. Louis rivalry is more than Chiz hockey. It's baseball too. Uh, it didn't help when Chris Bryant was still with the Cubs and referred to St. Louis as boring. Uh, so St. Mm. Louis people just, there, there's a hatred of the cities that way, but um, both of those rivalries, the Detroit and the St. Louis ones, it's kind of a gentleman's rivalry, if you can call it that, and that all game, fans are going to be chirping each other, but after the game, the uh, two two sides are going to meet up at the bar and buy each there other beers go. and have a good time yeah. and just talk about the history. I think when it comes to the Hawks Preds rivalry. You can say it. You can say it. You're not going to hurt my fans. No, I I think Preds fans, they'll take the beer, but they're not going to offer the beer. Yeah. Um, (laughs) uh, If if there's a little bit of chirping going on, I think the Preds fans are a little more apt to throw in punches instead of words. Um, Yeah. And I don't, I don't agree with that at all. Anyone who's acting like a knucklehead like that. Right. Yeah. I I mean, from any fan. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, Whereas Hawks fans, I, I'm, I hate to say it, we, we don't look at that Preds rivalry in the same light as Preds fans. You know, as you said, oh, during, yeah. during that run, yeah, absolutely it was. But we also had the Vancouver rivalry there at the yeah. same time. And that, that was a little deeper because we were playing them in later rounds. Mm. Um, but that one fell off real quick. Uh, and, and the Predator one still hung on. And the fact that the Predator organization won't allow people with the Chicago zip code to buy tickets with their yeah. credit cards. Mm. That's what continues to fuel that rivalry for black. Yeah. Fans. Cause still they're like, we're not good anymore. And they still won't let us buy tickets. Because, uh, and, you know, and I just like, I mean that I'm not, I don't like that look personally coming from me as a fan of the predators, because that just signals that you don't have faith in your own fan base right. to show up and fill that arena up. Obviously, Blackhawks fans are some of the best traveled fans oh, all yeah. across the league. I don't care who they're playing, what city. I don't care if it – I mean, I'm interested to see when the Blackhawks play the uh, in the 5,000-seat Arizona State oh, Coyotes yeah. arena. Like, is it going to be 4,000 – are the Blackhawks fans going to just show up and fill out 5,000 seats and turn it into a small little home game? I mean, it's – it's Blackhawks fans tra- are some of the best yeah. traveled fans in the league, no doubt about it. Well, and that um, I, trip down to Nashville, it's an hour flight. You know, you oh, hop on easy. Southwest for like 59 bucks one way. And, you know, and I'm, this is going to sound weird. So I, my wife and I are looking to move down there. I've never been to Nashville, but everybody I know that's been down there. They're oh, like, you got to come down here. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm literally meeting with my realtor tomorrow because we're exploring a move. So awesome. <laughs> we're, we're getting down there. <laughs> Heck yeah, man. You'll love the city. It's a great city. And it's a hockey city. It really has yeah. been. It's, I mean, it's it really has become a hockey town. Going back to the whole, like, ticket thing and stuff, I'm kind of under the mindset of, you know, Blackhawks fans are going to show up whether you like it or not because yep. they are that eager of a fan base. Preds fans, it's on you to also show up, not dump your tickets to make money off your season tickets because that's a big – that, that that happens a lot. It happens yep. in Titans games. It's really worse with the Titans. But either way, to not to go down that rabbit hole. But um, I mean, I think it has the potential to grow to even a bigger rivalry. The biggest thing, and this is why I totally agree with you, obviously, on the first two rivals you mentioned, Detroit and St. Louis. The Preds are still such I wouldn't call them an infant franchise, but they're still a very, very young franchise. Yeah. And they've really only been playoff postseason relevant for like a decade now. You yep. know, their first their first five or six seasons, they were just they didn't they it was just a blue collar team um that was just trying to scratch and claw their way to a win every now and then. Now they're finally, you know, they're they're not Stanley Cup contenders. They've definitely fallen back a little bit recently, but they're at least relevant, I yep. would say. So I think the rivalry has the potential to definitely it grow. It over does. Time. You know, as, as you said, that the Detroit and St. Louis rivalries, it's because they've been around longer. You know, th- think of it as the family reunion. The, the Hawks are a grandpa at the family reunion picking on his offspring. You know, 
uh, well, his, his cousin, the the Wings, and then the offspring, the the Blues, because they've been around. <laughs> and then you got this yeah. teenager coming up, you know, the, the Predators. Yeah, they, they can go yeah. back and forth, but it's going to take a little bit of time. And, you know, you mentioned Nashville is a hockey city. I don't think when they were awarded that franchise, anybody would have thought of that. But there's a great book. I've read it, Hockey Tonk, by Craig Leopold, who was the original owner. And he talks about how he marketed hockey down there. And it was really using um, country music. He knew the way to get yeah. fans into the game was to, to get these country music stars there. And that would get people to show up. And it worked. And, yeah. you know, at the time, the... Titans, previously the Oilers weren't there. So it was kind of like Vegas in that yep. there, there wasn't a pro team. So people flocked to it. And now Vegas has the Raiders, but locals say that the Golden Knights are their team. They were yep. there first. They embraced That's the cool. team. And, That's really you cool. know, it, and I, I think Nashville's kind of the same way. Um, you know, I know there's talks of them maybe getting a major league baseball team and all of that, but yeah. the Preds are always going to be I gotta, you know, the first. I gotta, uh, I gotta push back on that just a little bit as Nashville native. It's always going to be a college football well, NFL yeah. town. I would say college football number one. Even though the Tennessee Vols are in Knoxville, they're not even in Nashville. I mean, literally, time stops when the Tennessee Vols are playing. I'm not even a Tennessee Vols fan. I actually, <laughs> don't cheer for them at all. But either way, um, yes, the Preds when they're playing well, especially when they in 2017 during that playoff run that no one saw coming the city was completely gripped um i'm sure a lot of fans will laugh at this opposing fans but when the, the um the night they beat the ducks to clinch a spot in the stanley cup there were strangers hugging each other outside of bars downtown nashville like and i know that sounds cheesy because they didn't even win the cup they just want made it into the final but that's that's how young this fan base is and that's how much we're just we're just looking for that first Stanley Cup, you know, to get that monkey yep. off our back or whatever. But um, that, that's not cheesy because I'm a, cu a lifelong Cup fan. I grew up on the south side, like in the north side team. So in 2016, strangers were hugging. It, yeah. it, that the, the weekend they won, that was the first weekend in months that they didn't have one murder all weekend. Like they went four mm -hmm. days without them. So wow. strangers hugging. Yeah, yeah I, I get that's that. Cool. It's, and that's yeah. one of the best things about sports when you see stuff like that, you know, because it brings us together in that way. So the Preds are definitely up there. Uh, as far I love that you brought up like that book by Craig Leopold and when they first came here. Because me being a Nashville native and maybe for some of our listeners who are new to Nashville and they don't know about it, but definitely the natives know about it that whole Broadway scene really did grow around the predators. Like, and that's not a stretch of the imagination at all because Broadway was pretty dead. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. When, uh, when that arena was built two years before the Preds played their first season, there was not a really anything on Broadway. It was actually pretty sketchy. Um, there was a couple old honky tonks, but it was nothing like, like it is today, obviously. And it grew around the Preds. It really did. The Preds are like an entertainment. They're just not just hockey. Their entertainment. That's why the NHL is bringing the draft back there in 2023. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it's great and it's awesome. And I think we should welcome Blackhawks fans and all fan bases to come down here and make it a fun, fun time. You know, if there's 40, 50% Blackhawks fans and it's half Preds fans, okay, let's have a good time. Let's have a good game. Let, let's, let's, let, we can chirp at each other, like you said, but let's, let's keep it civil at the same time. But I definitely think it's going to grow. All right. We got Joe with us of the Tendy Talk podcast at Washed Up Goalie on Twitter. Go check out the podcast. Let's wrap up this awesome segment with this. All right, we did a segment a couple episodes ago, Rit, um, uh, Joe, with my host, uh, Rich, and uh, Kyle Perkins, um, talking about is there any team realistically that can maybe give the Avalanche like a little bit of a run this year in the Central Division? Or do you think the Central Division has become so top-heavy at this point that it's the avalanche and then it's everyone else just kind of squabbling around maybe. Yeah. You know, I, I, it's clearly the abs. I thought the wild had potential to push a little further, but I think they're two, three years off. So I really like what Billy Garen's doing up here in Minnesota. Um, makes it a little bit harder to put up with my neighbors, but uh, I, I do <laughs> like what he's doing. Uh, but I will say, I started going to school here in Minnesota the year the Wild started, so I'm kind of a de facto Wild fan as long as they're not playing the Hawks. And I become, That's fair. That's yeah, fair. That, then I become obnoxious with my neighbors. I mean, when the Hawks were beating the Wild in the first 
thrown every year. I was hanging ox banners from their garages and really upsetting them. Um, <laughs> but I, I thought the wild could have, um, I, I kind of lumped the wild and the Preds in, in the same group as yeah, they're scratching, but they're, they're just not as dominant. Um, yeah. you know, and, uh, who, who did Colorado go pick up in net? I, I know they let Kemper go. I forget who they got, but it, he's an upgrade. Um, I, yeah, I blame too many hockey up, yeah. pucks to the head. Uh, well, it's, well it's, it's not just that, but this off season has just had so much movement. I mean, yeah, it, it, a lot has happened this, this off season. It's been fun to watch, but it is really hard to keep up with it all. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can yeah. find it. I mean, losing Kadri is going to be an interesting one for them because yeah. um, I, I think he was more valuable to that team than abs fans probably realize. Uh, I, I've, I've been a fan of him for a long time. I, I think he just plays the game a little bit on the, on the uh, edges and that, that comes to bite him. I don't think he's as dirty of a player as some people say he is. I think he's just kind of a hard nosed player uh, very much like Jeremy Roenick was back in the day. Um, Dallas, Dallas doesn't scare me. St. Louis. I, I don't, I haven't see, really seen them get any better this year. So yeah, I, I got to say Colorado's got to be, you, a lot. I mean, and you can argue out of those lump of teams kind of chasing the avalanche that the Preds were the team that actually did go out this off season and get better. Yeah. Um, by getting Nino Niederreiter from the hurricanes, he's going to really give them some, some stability in the top six. And then of course yeah. they got Ryan McDonough for yeah. basically for basically Nothing. a bag of bag of pucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, back I when, mean, it was. I, I knew McDonough was a special player when I was coaching against him in high school. Uh, he, he's a good good hockey player. He's got that brings that leadership, um, yes. that veteran leadership. That's going to be really nice for uh, what is overall a pretty young. Nashville team, it, it, and, uh, and they've 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 chosen that reason. They've chosen to get younger. That was kind of their yeah. blueprint. But they've kind of they've kind of done a little bit of both here, they, and that's what you got to have. You got to have a nice blend of both. Unless you're just going full on tear it down rebuild, then you've got like to have a, <laughs> like the Hawks. Then you've got to you've got to have a blend of both if you're going to stay competitive. And that's what uh, our general manager David Poyle pretty much has been saying. And it actually has frustrated a lot of. Um, a lot of fans out there because they actually would prefer the Predators to just rip the Band-Aid off and, and rebuild this team and stop being painfully average every year and not having a chance in the playoffs. But that remains to be seen. Um, we'll see what happens. Maybe the Predators, you know, I, I think they're a playoff team again, but as far as going anywhere further than the first or maybe the second rounds, their ceiling, I mean, th they're not cup caliber for sure, at least not yet. Well, you know, you never know what can happen during the regular season and stuff, but – just looking on paper in the preseason, you know, their ceiling is probably top three in the division and maybe they make mm -hmm. it to the second round, which is they haven't made it to the second round since 2018. So, well, with the goalie like Soros, so you never know. You get to the playoffs, you never know. And, you know, you were talking earlier with um, Lincoln and, you know, maybe he can get 20 games. And this is something that frustrates me with modern hockey is why. Why can't goalies play more? You know, an old aging Grant Fuhrer played, what was it, 76 games in one of his last seasons. And as a goalie, you know, yeah, I understand some goalies, you, you got to let them listen to their body and they say that. But there's a lot of us out there that say, I, I play better the more I play. You know, let me play the back-to-backs. You don't see many goalies playing back-to-back -back nights anymore. Um, yeah. But I... I be willing to argue there's a lot of them that would say let me but coaches yeah. or management won't let them uh and when when you got a goalie like you know Soros if if, if he's not wearing down or anything like that you know let, let the goalie skip the morning skate that that's what you got e-bugs for they, they feel most of the e-bugs I know and talk to and um you know they, they participate in the morning skates for when the starter doesn't uh want to come out to that optional skate let the goalie skip those get that rest, come out and play. That's what you're paying them for. Um, mm. You know, it's great when you got a good 1A and 1B, but get, get the one dominant guy because the, the more a goalie plays, the better they are. If you get Soros uh, playing a lot and he gets hot right there at the end, they could make a deep run. They could do something and surprise people. That's a really good take, man. I really love that. And that's actually a take that I don't hear very often, you know, 
a lot of times I hear the opposite end of it. And but coming from a goalie yourself here, that's a really interesting and, and quality take. And I and I, I I'm thinking about it from a different perspective now when it comes to sorrows because I was one of those people, but I've never admittedly never played goaltender. But um, that's a really that makes sense at the same time. Like yes, the more they play the more they can get into a zone makes a mm -hmm. lot of sense. All right, Joe, thanks so much for joining us here on episode yeah. 142 of catfish and ice. It's been a lot of fun. Um, go follow at washed up goalie on Twitter. Listen to the Tindy talk podcast as we get ready for the 2022 23 season about a, about 40 something days away. So we're almost there. All right, Joe, take it easy. You too. We'll be in touch. All right. This has been episode 142 of catfish on ice. Take care, everybody.